Um, so let me, so I've been asked to talk about barriers. And so uh, barriers to data and research on Asian American and Pacific Islanders. And the way I want to do is uh, think about it uh, first conceptually and also have a vision about where we're going. It's hard to talk about barriers if we don't know what we want, what we need at the very end. And so one is conceptualizing barriers. The barriers are clearly just material, material uh, obstacles and impediments uh, to what we want to get done. In the case for this co uh, convening, it is the type of research that we need so we could really identify and develop effective and progressive action strategies, policies, and programs. That's the final prize. That is, how do we use and generate information and knowledge that really makes us effective social agents for change? And to understand that, again, what are the barriers? I think we need to think about what is it that we need as a whole, as a field, not necessarily as individual researchers or individual areas. And let me just start off by saying that uh, we have different types of research that are all legitimate. Uh, we ought to be vested in basic research. And what I mean by basic research is to develop conceptual and theoretical knowledge. That's important to understand how our society functions. And without that, we just have data and maybe just information. We also need to do applied research. That is to study specific problems and with the purpose of identifying actionable solutions and evaluating interventions. I think one of the things that makes us very different, the gathering here, is that we are social scientists. We are applied scientists. But we are also social scientists, applied scientists, that are not just interested in the phenomena. We're interested in identifying how we can intervene, how we can make a difference in terms of where we're going and where we end up. And we also need the type of research that essentially gathers and synthesizes information at the practice and at the programming and implementation level. Again, that's part of our desire to think about action and intervention. And clearly, these three types of research are not distinct, they overlap, and they should inform each other. There are some common challenges I think we all face in terms of doing this type of research. One is that we need to understand that the phenomena outcomes that we're concerned about come from and are produced by very complex systems that operates with multiple causalities, and that's operating at different levels. And we're not bounded by any particular discipline. Uh, many of us are trained in a particular discipline or within a particular professional area. And that's fast, and that's great. We need that depth of knowledge. But when we confront the real world and the real problem, we soon understand that, for example, economic, social, political, psychological, and other factors, structures, and forces really shape the outcomes. If we are just bounded by our discipline, we're probably blind to those factors that are important to understand how we intervene. And these forces, these sort of phenomena, operate at different levels. Uh, you don't need to go very far in terms of your research to realize that uh, these things operate at the individual level. They involve families and small groups. Neighborhoods and communities are forces that can help or impede in terms of what we want. Institutions and organizations are very key to these outcomes, as well as where we live, places, uh, regions, or even nations. And given this uh, complexity, there's also other complexities. Uh, what we're looking at tends to be very dynamic. And what I mean by that is history and change matter. Uh, it's hard to study many of these things without realizing that we really are studying things that occur over times, multiple time periods. These systems are nonlinear. And what I mean by that is quite often what we do at one stage feeds back and affects what happens. They're also path dependent, and we need to understand how that gets played out. Uh, they involve enormous variations across groups, locations, and periods. And so what's true, particularly when we do applied research, and we look at a particular problem, what we learn in terms of one case study may or may not be applicable. And therefore, that variation is a huge challenge for us to study these problems. And these messy challenges, I, I have to say these messy challenges are not unique to Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. 
But in some ways, I think our challenges are much more uh, daunting because of the ethnic diversity, language and culture, class, regions. The diversity within the AAPI communities and populations is so huge. Uh, I've done research on African Americans and Latinos also. And again, there's complexity there, but not the level of complexity that we face in the Asian American Pacific Islander populations. I just want to give you some examples about what I mean by complex issues. And these are issues I work with uh, my colleagues on. Uh, for example, in the environmental area, we're trying to assess the impact of eliminating toxic chemicals, what's called PERC, on minority communities and dry cleaners. Uh, this is sort of an environmental justice issue. Uh, why is it a concern to us? Partly because of our communities, but also because, like in Los Angeles, half of the dry cleaners are Koreans. Uh, we have a divided concern here. That is making sure our communities are not impacted by making sure dry cleaners, Korean dry cleaners, are not disproportionately impacted. To do that, you need complex data to understand the phenomenon, as well as over time. Health is another example. Uh, the obesity crisis, obesity crisis in specific populations and groups. To understand that, we're talking about how individuals behave, how families affect that, how neighborhoods affect that, either through resources, certain social networks and values, or through the lack of, for example, good food outlets. And how do you sort of integrate that into your analysis? Uh, I'll skip the other two, because uh, I want to move on. Uh, so the data that we really need, we need, really need data, for example, to understand the magnitude of the nature of the problems that we're facing. We also need data, and this is, again, a plea to understand that we have research at different levels. We also need data to uh, enable us to understand the relative importance and the path of causal factors. Uh, it's one thing to identify and make known to the public that there are problems that we face problems that, as a society, we ought to be concerned about. It's another thing, and I think this is one of our unique roles as social scientists, is begin to understand the causal factors with eye towards understanding from the complexity of causality, where do we intervene? Where do we have leverage points? We also need to have that sort of data to monitor and assess outcome. Again, our concern is not just basic social science. If we want to intervene, we need to understand whether our actions make a difference. And if they make a difference, how do they make a difference? If they're not making a difference, you know, how do we understand they're not making a difference and go back and redo our policies and programs? And clearly, we need that type of data that's ethnic, location, time-specific enough for us to unravel these causalities, to monitor things, to understand the magnitude and nature of problems. Um, you know, sometimes I, I like to imagine the best data set I could get a hold of, okay? And so I think we all sort of have that dream every once in a while uh, out there. And so, so you know, the, to handle these problems I just talked about, the complex problem, clearly here's what I want. I want detailed data that's at the micro level. That's longitudinal. That's a combination of administrative files, proprietary data, you know, merged with project-specific surveys and qualitative data that we collect, <laughs> and, and, and merge in the census and governmental data so we have this massive data set that we can really use for all that type of research. And that involves, for example, working with Dun & Bradstreet data. If you do city planning parcel data, uh, if you do economic work, you know, clearly survey minority-owned businesses, the Humda data for housing and so forth. And so you have, will have this wonderful ideal uh, data system. And the ideal data system is created from ideal data partnership. And what I mean by that is that you know, we work with all the appropriate stakeholders, including the federal agencies, in terms of collecting data so we have adequate co coverage of small groups and areas that's linguistically and culturally appropriate the way we gather information, that we assure confidentiality and therefore trust for those subjects that we have out there. <laughs> yeah, and, and data, and so it's not just collecting the data, but it's also data enhancement and the distribution of access. And data enhancement, what I mean is, how do we bring together all that data from different sources into this sort of wonderful data system that I have 
my mind in terms of what we want to do. And clearly, we want to have usage in such a way that makes maximum use of it. And what I mean by that is I learn from my colleagues. I learn from those in the public sector about how they collect the data, so I understand the limitations and so forth. I learn from my colleagues, uh, from my students, about how best we make use of that data, and it, that's an exchange of information ideas. And so that's the partnership that we want. And actually, in some ways, there are good models of how we've done that. And I think models are important. Uh, it's easy, quite easy to identify problems and talk about, you know, you should do this, you haven't done that. But it's equally important to think about models because uh, to move forward, we need to have concrete examples. Uh, a good example is the work between the National Cancer Institute and CHIS, the California Health Interview Survey, a collaboration in terms of developing both the survey instrument evaluating whether CHIS is adequately and representatively covering the Asian population. Uh, it also helps that the National Cancer Institute pump money into this. So that's another part of the, the partnership. Another good example, it, it, I'm a, I've been intrigued by, we talked a little bit about that, is the Longitudinal Employment and Household Dynamics pro Program. Uh, there was a small pilot project where we actually linked that administrative longitudinal data on employment and businesses to the one in six sample from the 2000 census at the micro level. That is the ability to, to uh, link survey data to administrative data and use that information to study things. Uh, I think there are other examples about how we could do this. Uh, did you know, for example, that the Native Hawaiian homeland geographies were put into uh, the census as official geography out of the 2,000 efforts, uh, working with the Census Bureau, telling them that it's important to have that geography, telling them that technically it's possible, actually providing the boundaries to them to show that it's possible. Uh, but in the end, we now have, as official geography, Native Hawaiian homelands. And so partnerships are very important, and certainly we have examples of how that could work. Unfortunately, these examples are more exceptions than the rule. Uh, but again, we can learn from it, but we identify huge gaps. Uh, in my opinion, clearly there is a lack of in-house Asian American Pacific Islander expertise in most federal and governmental agencies. My discussion with many of these agencies, I also get the perception that it's not important for them to have that expertise. I think that is too bad because I think we can learn a lot by making a priority within these agencies to get that expertise. It could be through hiring or it could be through partnerships, you know, deep partnerships in terms of exchanging ideas and information. Uh, I think we need to have better linkage in between our researchers that are university-based in the academy with public agencies. Uh, REAC sometimes works and doesn't work. It's more ad hoc in terms of linking researchers to the Bureau of Census. Certainly we could learn a lot by where it does work. Uh, quite often, some of us get brought in as consultants, you know, so when there's a pressing issues on AAPIs, the agency will bring you in as an ad hoc consultant, but that's ad hoc. I mean, that's all the limitations of, of that. I think we are also guilty. I mean, it's easy, again, to t uh, point our fingers at public agencies. I think we're also guilty because within Asian American Studies, Ethics Studies, uh, applied and policy research is really underdeveloped. It's an area that we have not trained a lot of our students in. It's not an area that's core to what we've been doing. So we have to look inwards and in figure out how we do that. As a result of all these sort of barriers and problems, it's numerous pr uh, problems that you see in the handout in the uh, package you got. Uh, the problems of uh, small groups, the problems of access and so forth. Uh, so what can we do? And actually, what I want to do is not talk about specific uh, recommendations. I think that will come up uh, throughout today and tomorrow. But I think we should think broadly. One is that I think we need to think about institutional and organizational change. And what I mean by that is one of the things is really building bridges across academic and the academy and the public sectors building bridges across silos that exist within the academy and within the public sector. That is, how do we encourage communications and partnership that bridges across different areas? 
If we don't do that, then it's hard for us, for example, to pull in the economic data with the health data. It's impossible for us how do we pull in the housing data with some of the data on environmental impact and environmental risk. Uh, there's another broad issue we ought to be concerned about is resources. And this is not the best of times to think about resources. Uh, I think we still should continue to demand a fair share of the resources. But to what degree resources are put into studying diversity, differences, and so forth, we need to have a fair share. We need to be at that table in terms of the resources. But I think there's also a burden because if you have limited resources, uh, there are two things you could do. One is greater efficiency about how we use our resources. It is a pity, for example, how often we reinvent the wheel. That is, when you start on a project, that I notice that we go through the same process of rediscovering things, about coming up with the same methodology and so forth. That's a huge waste of your time and resources. And so we need to think about changes that allow us to have greater efficiency, and part of that is what economists call economies of scales. Uh, I have to be completely guilty. I'm a, an economist by training, so I think of the world that way. But, but I think there's some truth in thinking about greater efficiencies in economies of scales and how we could achieve that. Um, and we also need to somehow not, w overcoming the reinventing wheel really means how do we develop a body of knowledge and practice that's readily out there. And so we have access to that. Now, we have not done that very well as a field in terms of developing that systematic, codified knowledge uh, base out there. And so I think those are the larger challenges that applies to any agency or any of these areas. Uh, clearly, uh, they're not to preclude the fact that when we talk about health data, business data, immigration data, any specific data, that there will be specific and unique problems. And we need to think about how we fill out the details. If you don't have the details, we won't make much progress. But at the same time, I encourage us to keep the eye, our eyes on the prize. That is, how do we bring about a larger change, institutional change, practice change, that allows us to move forward and move the field forward. I would also say that um, although I said I have my ideal uh, vision about that data set out there, that detail, micro level, longitudinal, <laughs> place specific time, multiple time and all that, uh, there's much to be said about what's always been beaten into my head. That is, don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. I think what we can make out of what we do today and tomorrow is think about how do we make incremental progress in such a way it moves us forward towards that final vision about where we want to be. And so that's my, my final comment, and I want to thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Paul. You can all see why uh, Paul has so many students. Uh, so many followers uh, because of his genuine concern and that it comes across you know with with his work with the students and researchers and in all the federal agencies so we're again very grateful for the work that you're doing he's our motivator out there and so I'd like to t now um, invite Nadia to, to speak about um, to further dis go into the details we're going to save the big gun Kathy Wallman <laughs> for the <laughs> final <laughs> remarks as everyone's you know, she, she's got a lot to say, we know. Um, and so Nadia, exactly what Paul is talking about in, um, and why we're doing this work, why we're doing this research is to be um, agents of social change. And I think Nadia's work is exemplary of that because she's worked with tax, you know, organizing taxi drivers, um, you know, working with laborers in New York City. Her paper is actually in the packet, which was just um, published. So we're, it was just published in November, right, last month. So, and it, it goes into the details of this very issue. And talking about two degrees of separation, Deanna Jang, who's here, um, she's worked very closely with the initiative and she's now at DOJ. She's one of the co-authors of the paper. And she's um, at DOJ's uh, 
um, core office, and we're really lucky to have our our leaders in positions of leadership in the administration. And so, um, a leader in the field upcoming is Nadia Islam. So I invite her to the. I don't know if you wanted to stay there or come up here. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let me just get set up here. Okay, so I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, again, my name is Nadia Islam, and I'm the Deputy Director of the NYU Center for the Study of Asian American Health. We are a National Institute of Health funded research center of excellence, and I'm really pleased to be here representing the center and to be given this opportunity to share what we think are some very important issues regarding methodological challenges and some potential solutions for the collection, analysis, and reporting of data. So, how do I do this? Yeah. Okay. So, I think Christina mentioned that this presentation is based on a paper that was very recently published, so it was very fortuitous timing with this event. Um, and I would like to just start by acknowledging my co-authors, including Deanna, who's in the room, um, as well as Dr. Simona Kwan, Suila Khan, Margarita Rowe, and Chow Trin Chevron. So why is this issue important? Um, I was told, actually, that the audience would be uh, people who are unfamiliar with this issue, but clearly that's not the case. I see many friendly faces, familiar faces, and really leading experts uh, in these issues. Um, but as we know, despite the rapid population growth in our communities, we remain understudied and for the most part poorly understood, particularly in terms of health disparities, which is my area of focus, but across so many other social and economic indicators as well. Um, in terms of data collection and reporting, the Institute of Medicine and National Research Council have issued recent reports calling for data collection on patient race, ethnicity, and language use as a strategy for actually improving health disparities. We do know that there are limitations to what we currently have available in terms of the published literature. In a 2003 study that's, I think, very well known and cited now, Dr. Koch found that very small numbers, 0.2% of federal grants were dedicated to Asian American health disparities, 0.01% of publications were dedicated to looking at Asian American groups. Now I will say that since this is a 2003 study, since this time there have been huge strides, particularly from the federal government in terms of funding initiatives and research studies um, regarding Asian American health. I think the initiatives that I'm a part of is a great example of that, but um, many that you all in the room are a part of as well. Um, we know that in terms of what is available in the published literature, there, is, um, there are issues with the quality in terms of aggregated data, small sample sizes, inconsistent definitions of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Much of the literature that we have is unevenly distributed by geographic region. So what I'm going to do today is give really kind of set the context, I hope, for the remainder of the the conversations and discussions that will happen during the rest of the conference. I'm going to start off by talking about some of the limitations of large national data collection efforts, and I am going to focus um, my talk on large national data collection efforts. Um, and then I'm going to go on to present some potential solutions or ideas for how we might address those challenges. Um, so in the paper, uh, we explore several challenges that exist in terms of the collection, reporting, and analysis in large national data sets. This include lack or limited subgroup categorization of Asian American subgroups, inconsistent definitions of Asian Americans, limited data collection in Asian languages, the uneven distribution of geographic representation, small sample sizes, and lack of oversampling among Asian groups, limitations to random digit dial sampling methods, lack of implementation of OMB standards in terms of race and ethnicity, and lack of or inconsistent um, reporting of race and ethnicity data in disease registries, health plans, and hospitals. So this is an overview of all of the challenges that I explore in the paper. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few of these just for the sake of time. 
So in terms of um, lack or limited subgroup categorization, if you do a survey of many of the large national federally funded data collection efforts, you'll see that what we have is sort of a, a patchwork of some surveys that collect some race and ethnicity data, many surveys that, co uh, that report only racial data. Um, and so this, is, this gives you an idea. For example, National Health Interview Survey does include ethnic subgroup variables, but only for Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Filipino, Asian, Indian, and Vietnamese. And Haynes, for example, does also collect ethnic subgroup variables, but it's not available in the publicly, in public data sets. A survey like the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey, racial data is only available. And then the census we know is a, is a great example of um, providing very detailed disaggregated data. Another issue is the limited data collection in Asian languages. Um, I'm not going to go over this in too much detail, but we do know that in our communities there are high rates of limited English proficiency. Um, there are many households that are linguistically isolated, and many Asian American families speak a language other than English at home. So clearly this has large implication in terms of data collection when it's conducted only in English. So again, if you do a survey of some of the large national data collection efforts, again, you see this sort of patchwork of some, some um, efforts that do employ um, interpreters or bilingual data collectors, but others that are conducted in English or Spanish only, um, which uh, will not be helpful for, for many of our communities. So another um, issue that we explore in the paper uh, the limitations to random digit dialing um, telephone surveying methodologies, which many large-scale national data collection efforts employ. Um, studies have documented that racial and ethnic minority groups are less likely to own a landline than white populations. And in recent years, there has been, in, there's been increasing um, investigation into looking at Asian Americans and cellular phone ownership. And studies have found that Asian Americans as a whole have Larger, larger use of cellular phones as compared to landlines. Um, some of the data that's presented here is a little bit outdated. Um, recent data actually shows that there's much, even larger percentages of uh, families that have cell phone only households and do not have landlines. The National um, Health Interview Survey actually um, released a report in 2007 and concluded that the inability to reach households with only wireless telephones has potential implications for results from health surveys. The potential for bias due to under coverage remains a real and growing threat. So if you look at a, a snapshot of some of the large national surveys, you'll see that uh, many of them are conducted by phone. Um, and I know this, I think this is changing recently, but um, the majority do not include cell phones as part of their sampling strategy. And finally, another issue I just want to highlight is the reporting of patient data. So the reporting of race and ethnicity data within things like disease registries, hospitals, and health plans is inconsistent at best or does not occur at all. And some examples um, that I could highlight include um, from the National Vital Statistics, which record identification of Chinese, Filipinos, and Japanese in all 50 states, but other ethnic groups are only recorded in nine states. Um, another example is the Department of Veteran Affairs administrative data, which contains some of the highest rates of misclassification of Asian Americans. And so I think a gentleman in the audience earlier had asked about the implications for using administrative data in place of census data, and so potentially the implications would be profound. So um, I think Dr. Ong said, you know, it's great to talk about challenges, but you know, that doesn't really get us anywhere unless we can think of some constructive solutions. So I'd like to offer a few, a few um, examples and potential solutions for disaggregated data collection analysis and reporting based on the work of many of you here in this room as well as some work that we're doing at NYU. So some of the examples I'm going to highlight include pooling data, um, using large-scale national and state-based epidemiological studies, creating clinical epidemiology data repositories, and using other innovative community-based or alternative sampling strategies. 
So in terms of pooling data, um, in national studies that have annual data collection, data can be combined across several years to yield larger sample sizes for smaller um, sub-ethnic groups. So some of the benefits of using this approach are that we can increase reliability of estimates for some of the smaller population subgroups. I think Dr. Grove had uh, alluded to this. And it would potentially allow for comparison comparability of Asian American subgroups to other racial and ethnic minority groups. Um, some of the drawbacks to this approach are that it does not address limitations related to the data collection strategies in the first place. Um, there are often, across surveys, inconsistent definitions and classification of ethnicity across data sets. Um, and variables may not be consistent across all years, across uh, even within the same survey. Um, and then the other challenge, and this is in particular in regards to health research, but as well as other types of research, this pooling data would, you know, does not enable us to detect trends across time, which is important as well. So some examples of some publications that have yielded some, some fruitful publications using pooled data include um, a report released by the CDC in 2008, which pooled um, National Health Interview Survey data, and a report that was conducted in conjunction with the Asian Pacific Islander Health Forum and the Kaiser Family Foundation, looking at health coverage across Asian American subgroups. This is some, oh, some of our own work from NYU. We have worked with the New York City Department of Health, which conducts an annual community health survey and does oversample Asian Americans. Despite the oversampling of Asian Americans, in one year, the sample sizes are too small to conduct um, subgroup comparison. So we have worked with the city to analyze data, pool data. Um, we're also doing a similar analysis with the Massachusetts Department of Health that conducts a similar data. So we're hoping to do some comparisons across New York and Massachusetts. So another suggestion um, is to implement national or state-based epidemiological studies in Asian American populations. And in order, this, what this would do is to ensure geographic and ethnic subgroup representation of Asian Americans. And so some of, you know, some of the benefits of this approach are that you do have better geographic representation, it allows for disaggregation of data, and the larger sample sizes allows for examination of various, you know, other critical factors impacting health. Um, the drawbacks to studies like this are that they tend to be rather expensive. Um, there are concerns about logistics and feasibility, and there, these studies often do encounter data collection barriers. And I think the example I'll highlight is probably very well known to many of you here in this room. It's the National Latino and Asian American Study that has yielded numerous, numerous publications in recent years regarding the role of discrimination on health outcomes, as well as a whole host of other factors um, and mental health outcomes. Um, so, and last for those of you who don't know, is a nationally representative household sample of Latino and Asian Americans. It was a face-to-face -face, um, administered survey and targeted Asian American individuals. And the th there were three national origin groups that were targeted, including Chinese, Filipino, and Vietnamese, but other Asian groups were included. So moving on, another suggestion in terms of getting access to clinical data is to implement clinical epidemiology data repositories. Um, some of the pros to this um, approach are that we can get clinical rather than self-report data on morbidity, um, which is what we usually get from surveys. Um, the data collection can be integrated with community screening and intervention research, and data can inform regional health planning and policy development and clinical and epidemiological data can be integrated. So some of the drawbacks to this approach are that regional data does not allow for national comparisons. Um, these types of repositories that are created are often based on convenient sampling strategies, so there's a question about generalizability. And again, there are cost and feasibility issues. So an example I'd like to highlight is from um, some of our own work at NYU, and my colleague, Dr. Henry Pollack, will be um, speaking more about this later on today. Um, but through the Asian American Hepatitis B program, community-based screenings were conducted in New York City in collaboration with community-based partners uh, across a range of Asian American communities. And over 10,000 individuals were screened for hepatitis B. And all screened individuals completed a 30-item questionnaire assessing demographic characteristics as well as knowledge and behaviors related to hepatitis B. And some of um, the findings from our study were published in MMWR. 
So the last um, example that I'm going to talk about as a potential way of addressing some of these data challenges are to employ more innovative community-based sampling strategies. So community-based sampling strategies such as snowball sampling, respondent-driven sampling, venue-based sampling, or street intercept sampling can be employed to target harder to reach populations. Um, some of the benefits of this are that it does capture hard to reach populations such as new or undocumented immigrants, linguistically isolated groups, um, very smaller subgroups within immigrant communities. Um, these methodologies usually do not rely on telephone surveying. And when conducted within a community-based participatory research framework, they can often generate substantial sample sizes which allow for the disaggregation of data. Um, some of the drawbacks to the approach are that these, they, these typically are not a randomized uh, sampling approaches and regional data may not be generalizable to the overall population or on a national level. An example of uh, street intercept sampling that we have done at NYU um, is a part of a larger center grant that we have that's funded from the CDC called the Be Free Seed. It's a national center of excellence, the elimination of hepatitis B disparities. And we gathered formative data to inform the development of an evidence-based social marketing campaign to increase awareness of hepatitis B in Korean and Chinese communities in New York City. And we did use a street intercepts um, uh, methodology which involved two things. Um, we first conducted an environmental scan of areas in New York City with high population of Chinese and Koreans. And within these areas, high traffic areas and venues were targeted to conduct the surveys. And we designated a marker at each location and every third person was approached to conduct the survey. So from that survey, we have a sample size of approximately 1,000 individuals. 500 surveys were conducted in the Korean population and 500 in the Chinese. And um, I just want to focus your attention to, I guess it's your left-hand side. Um, we collected information on telephone usage and cell phone usage within the survey to be able to make the case for these type of sampling strategies. And what we found is that about 30% of individuals in each population had only a cell phone, no landline. So what the implications for that are that we would have missed approximately 30% of individuals that we surveyed if we had not received community input and decided to use this type of strategy rather than, for example, a randomized telephone survey strategy. So some of my recommendations and conclusions, not mine, recommendations and conclusions of all of the authors on our paper um, include um, a, a whole host of things. Implementing and collecting Asian subgroup ethnicity across data sets I think is critical. Um, standardizing data collection and implementing o OMB standards. And to try to avoid the classification of Asian Americans by country of birth since this is not always an accurate representation of ethnicity. Um, in terms of data collection, providing bilingual interpreters for data collection is going to continue to be important. Working with community-based organizations to collect the data, the census is a good model of that. Um, and when we're using telephone-based strategies, utilizing language lines for telephone surveys, which some of the large national data collections do use. Um, we should continue to support efforts to oversample data across geographic areas and support sort of the range of factors that are related to that. We need to advocate for more funding for oversampling, that oversampling happens on a continued basis, et cetera. Um, employing innovative sampling and, and analysis methods, um, including cell phone only households and telephone based surveys are two other important areas. And finally, I think something that uh, many of our presenters have alluded to are to really to continue to try to coordinate across research sites and have multi-site studies to create data repositories across geographic areas and to pool and link data sets as much as possible. So I'm going to end with that and I'll be happy to take any questions at the end. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, as Paul said, you know, I think only in this room can you talk about your dream data set and really dream about it. <laughs> well, here we also think about the dream abstract and basically Nadia's paper was that with her colleagues because it just outlines the problem and it's published now so that we can forward it to others and it ex provides very clear examples of all the, the federal data sets. So we really appreciate it. Um, and, you know, I just want to take this time to, if the, our federal partners could raise your hand so that we can 
identify you. So you will be, thank you very much, praise on high. So everyone should know that these are our, our friends who are here today, and they're taking ravishly, no, you know, their notes, I can see, on what they're going to bring back to their agencies and to implement into their agency plans and improve data collection for our community. Um, and so uh, with, we will uh, wrap up with our, um, <laughs> the person who is, gets a lot of questions. Uh, I actually worked at OMB for seven years and if I hear about this directive one more time, <laughs> I told Kathy that you just need to put an end to it right now. <laughs> and she is the perfect person to talk about it because she's been there since the beginning. Uh, you have her bio there. She is the queen bee statistician for the federal government. And it, you know anything that happened at OMB if, uh, that was related to statistics you know, in the federal agents, you had to clear it through. Uh, Kathy and her office, and so we're really privileged to have her with us. But not only that, but you know, we talk about as the initiative that our goal is actually to become obsolete. And the only way we can become obsolete is if we have change coming from within and it's institutionalized. And the only way we can do that is if we have people in leadership positions who are um, advocating such change and and Kathy is the perfect example of that. She is an advocate for our community. I know she probably can't use that word with OMB in the same <laughs> sentence, but I'm going to say it anyway. So without further ado, I'd um, like to welcome Kathy. Thank you. And that there's a working group right now at the federal level that's working on that section 4302. And also regarding the National Household Interview Survey and the NHANES survey, there will increase over sampling for Asian Americans. And these are all contained in our HHS agency plan submitted to the White House initiative. And once it's posted online in their website, we hope you would um, give your comments on this because one of the priority areas for us is the data collection. Well, thank you very much. Um, Christina, thank you for that very gracious introduction. I didn't know I impressed you that much during your seven years at OMB, <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm happy to uh, know that. Uh, I uh, do have the responsibility as chief statistician for a number of things in the decentralized federal statistical system. I'm, and I'm going to spend about 30 seconds on that part just to put myself in context here. I'm very different from the colleagues to my right and left here in terms of how I spend my days, uh, nights, weekends, <laughs> holidays, and so on. I, I was uh, taken with the, uh, the get data, uh, got data uh, conversation at the beginning today. Um, the American Statistical Association has another T-shirt available. Um, that uh, former OMB director Peter Orsag um, coveted. You may, if you know Peter at all, you know if, if there's a data geek, sorry, Peter. Um, if there, he, he self identifies this way, though. So if there's a data geek in our midst, it's Peter Orsag, uh, former OMB director. But he coveted when I came home uh, from one of our meetings at Cisco meetings, he coveted the t shirt that said, uh, Friends don't let friends derive drunk. Uh, so Peter now has one of those. You may know, you may know he's a runner, uh, and so he wears it also with care, uh, where where he's wearing it. But that we, uh, they, they think we're weird as statisticians and you know nerdy and all that kind of stuff. But we have a sense of humor somewhere uh, buried down there beneath. Um, the, uh, the statistical policy function has has been around at OMB since 1939. 
Um, I'm not going to uh, regale you with stories of, of, of uh, what's been going on since that time, but only to uh, highlight that the reason we have this statistical policy coordination standard setting function at OMB is because we have a very decentralized statistical system in the United States, uh, which you are aware of because we've already talked about the different agencies you've tried to work with um, and tried to uh, have com comparable data and so on. Um, amongst other things in my role at OMB, um, I do have the opportunity to have a, a perspective across the statistical system. So when we're talking about budgeting, we're doing a lot of talking about budgeting these days. We're not sure which budget we're talking about anymore. But um, when we talk about budgets, I, I do have a, a lens that looks across the statistical system so that if we need complementary things going on in order to ultimately produce GDP or something, that's usually the easiest example. And I have an economist on my right, so he'll support me here. So that we, we have the component pieces that we need. Uh, so in budgeting, we play a role. Uh, we also, Christina alluded to this, I think, I have the responsibility and have since uh, 1940, apparently 42, uh, responsibility at OMB for approving every information collection that's promulgated by the federal government. Just to give you scope on that, and by the way, I'm thrilled to see a whole room full of people I don't know. This is great. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm you know, with the choir and whatever, and I, I know very few of you in this room today, so I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to get to know more of you. Uh, we have about uh, 8,000 live data collections, information collections in the federal government at any time. Now, those are, that's everything, okay? That's tax forms, that's compliance forms, that's regulatory forms. It's also evaluations and statistics and so on. I would say they probably uh, account for less than 5% of the total burden in any event uh, that we impose in, in reporting on the, on the American population. But that said, um, all of those uh, information collections hold a clearance for only three years. This is not by OMB directive. This is because the Paperwork Reduction Act uh, and its precursor uh, said that's the way it is. So we in OMB are constantly reviewing information collections that are being promulgated by agencies of the federal government. And if you did some quick math there, approaching 3,000 a year because the maximum approval is for three years. So uh, that's very sloppy arithmetic that I just did. But It'll give you an order of magnitude of what we, what we see going through. And it's important to know that we have that role in this conversation only to know that this is a very important mechanism for us to monitor implementation of standards in federal reporting requirements. So that's the link. Why, why is it important? So I'm just trying to tell you about these other functions of budgeting and information collection review because they're pieces of a puzzle that help us in efforts that we may undertake uh, with you uh, and, and in addition to with you um, to, to meet the kinds of objectives you have. Um, I, 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 that <laughs> the, um, I, 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 all the I, I was trying to think of a word to describe the database that, um, that was being um, suggested <laughs> uh, by my colleague to my right. And the only thing that came to mind, frankly, was supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, <laughs> because it's the longest word I could think of. Um, and, you know, so uh, maybe that is what it is. Wasn't that Mary Poppins or, you know, somebody <laughs> who, you know, sort of dreamed around? But, um, but you know, the, the point you made, actually, and I, I was drawing a circle on the table as he was talking, because he was coming full circle on what I think is probably, I've been saying this for 20 years, but I still think it's probably the naughtiest issue we face in the work that we do, and that is the tension between maintaining the confidentiality. Bob Groves talked about this this morning. That's, it's important for people to realize if they don't know it, that if you set aside the decennial census and the American Community Survey, virtually everything we collect from the American people is collected based on their voluntary cooperation with us. These are not mandatory surveys. The whole stream of health surveys that's been discussed here, but you can iterate that. If we're talking about education, if we're talking about the current population survey, is Tom in the room yet? Tom Nardone, who's supposed to be joining you. Ah, oh, I see his hand. I couldn't see his face, sorry. Okay, he's wonderful. Um, the current population survey that gives you those famous monthly employment, unemployment numbers, roughly, not 
exactly, but roughly the first Friday of every month of the year, is a voluntary survey. We enjoy the voluntary cooperation of the American public, in my view, because we promise them confidentiality. So that's one side of this. I was going to say one side of this coin, but then I was drawing a circle, right? So what is the other thing that I personally believe is the biggest counterweight tension is the desire of a very now computer literate <laughs> society to have the microdata, the detailed information, more and more and more, because it's there and because they have the technology to work with it in ways that when I was on my first IBM 360-65, yes, <laughs> you know, it didn't look like the laptops everybody has here that they can manipulate the information and so on. But I think this is a huge tension that we face, and we, you know, we can dream. I dream too. I call, they call me Pollyanna sometimes, not not without good reason. But, you know, but I think we have to be alert to those tensions in in uh, when we ask for things. I, um, so, I um, I did want to um, then come to standards, and uh, in particular. Uh, the standards that we have for the collection and presentation of data on race and ethnicity, which is the featured reason that I'm here um, this morning, I think. I'm, this uh, standard, I think, is probably well known to uh, many people in this room, apparently. I'm, why is OMB in the standards business? We're in the standards business primarily because of this decentralized system that I mentioned um, at, at the outset and the need to have what I call a common language uh, when we're talking across that system. So that when we talk about industries or when we talk about occupations, indeed when we talk about metropolitan statistical areas, which is a kind of classification for presentation, not for collection, but when we talk about any of these key variables, if you will, that we're talking about them in a consistent way so that we have numerators and denominators that match. Take it that way if you want. I, I call the census the great denominator and, and everything we're doing in all these specialized surveys as the numerators and we need those to match. Data on race and ethnicity uh, was one of the areas where back in the 70s, that's the 1970s, uh, and there's a couple people in the room I know who remember. <laughs> back in the 1970s, uh, the originally, uh, well, it was Casper Weinberger who was uh, at the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, for those who are <laughs> into history here. Um, uh, he was worried about the comparability of data uh, in uh, education. There was a federal interagency committee on education, and Casper uh, Weinberger, uh, as secretary of HEW, came to OMB at the time it was in 1974, roughly, something like that, and said, we've come to consensus in the education community about a standard way of asking for data on race and ethnicity in federal reporting that we're doing. Could that be uh, expanded to cover more uh, domains that the federal government inquires about? And so OMB, the same office that I, I'm at now, um, OMB took on that role of convening I'm uh, an interagency group to work and see if we could, for the first time, frankly, issue some sort of standard for data on race and ethnicity. That's the well-known Directive 15, Statistical Policy Directive 15. It got that clever title, which means nothing to anybody except people in this room and, and others like you who know what it is. Anyway, that was issued in the, in the 1970s, and so that served us reasonably well for a decade or two. Um, and uh, then in the uh, early 90s, after the 1990s, <laughs> after the uh, 1990 census, there was a, a fairly major, I'll call it public uh, expression of concern and interest about the way that data on race and ethnicity were being collected by the federal government. And two things really brought this to people's attention. One was the 1990 census. And the other was increasingly parents uh, yeah, were filling out education forms for their kids, uh, and particularly at the elementary school level, because when they're in high school and beyond, theoretically they're filling out their, I don't know if they are or not, but anyway. But parents were uh, struck, shall we say, by the, uh, what they viewed as the inadequacy of the, of the uh, classification system that they were being asked to use 
uh, in identifying their kids for purposes of uh, federal uh, funding that was coming through school systems. That's, I'm oversimplifying, but that's basically what it's about. And if you live anywhere, you probably get a form somewhere towards the beginning of the school year or during the summer asking whether there are any kids in the household and what their ages and races and so on are. Uh, so uh, that public concern came to us. Uh, we had some concerns of our own, frankly, because when we started examining the responses uh, to the 1990 census, uh, there were half a million people who were giving us categories that didn't fit. And now we'll eliminate for this conversation the ones who wrote down human for the race. <laughs> you know. I actually have a brother <laughs> who's four years older than I am. And he called me uh, during the 2010 census. Bob knows the story, but he's gone now. He called me during the 2010 census to tell me about this hoot of a person in his neighborhood who was going to write in human in the race thing. <laughs> I get along pretty well with my brother, but my brother really got it from me that in that <laughs> phone conversation. Anyway, I'm, w anyway, there were a half a million people. This is not a big number compared to the numbers that Bob was showing you for the estimate of the population, but you can imagine if you looked carefully at those half a million responses, they were uh, not distributed equally across uh, different groups in the population and so on. So there were changing dem demographics in the country, changing immigration patterns. There were a number of both, if you want to call them statistical demographic uh, issues, and there were a number of, I'll call them personal identification issues that drove us uh, to uh, a conclusion in the, in the early 90s that it was time to reexamine the standards we had set in place. Um, and uh, to do that in a time frame that would make any standards that we, pre that we, any changes that we made available for use beginning with uh, what was the census 2000. Um, and so for those who don't know the history, I'll just try to say it in a few words. Um, we had what we, we preferred to, came to call a three-prong approach to this. We did um, a lot of research. Um, within the statistical agencies, um, BLS and Census were, and National Center for Health Statistics, I think I'll, I'll call out as probably the three big leaders on this, but National Center for Education Statistics and others were, were involved in this. But we did research to test various um, approaches to collecting data on race and ethnicity that were different from what we had been done doing in the past and that had been suggested to us uh, by the research community or through our own experience. I'm speaking royally here. I don't do this work myself, but when I say we, I'm talking about the federal statistical community. So prong one we'll call research. Prong two was we uh, convened an interagency committee. I think there were 30 agencies on it, and they were the principal producers and users of statistics on race and ethnicity. So in one sense, you can think about the census as a principal producer or the National Center for Health Statistics, but there were also a number of agencies at that table <coughs> who really don't collect much data themselves but depend <laughs> heavily uh, and constantly on the data that's produced by the system. The third prong of this initiative uh, was uh, what I'll call public outreach, and there were a couple of approaches to that, um, including uh, putting out uh, a number of calls for public views, uh, ranging from the very open-ended one at the beginning of the process, which was, we're thinking about possibly changing, what would you like to see us do? Um, which did, in fact, inform some of the research um, component of this as well. Um, to, as we came along with the research results and started you know, uh, framing what, where we might be going, we put out a series of federal register notices. These, by the way, are all uh, on the website if anybody really wants to become a student of history of this activity. Um, the third thing we did, which was unique in my OMB experience, was to, um, in terms of outreach, was to host or to participate in, I should say, um, a series, a small series of public hearings. Um, and we did four of them, and we, they were not all in Washington. Um, they, uh, they started in, in fact, none of them were in Washington. We started in Boston, and we uh, were in Colorado, and we were in California. And then because Senator Akaka and Esther said we had to, uh, we were in Honolulu also for a day listening to the Asian Pacific Island communities, and they actually um, 
a number of people flew in, I think, from the other Pacific Islands to participate in those hearings, if I remember correctly. Um, th those hearings, incidentally, were exceptionally informative um, to our decision making, and I um, had a chance to say this to, to Esther again uh, yesterday, but I'm central, central to the conclusion we reached about separating out the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander uh, group from the overall Asian group in our standard at that time, central to that decision was the very compelling testimony we heard, particularly, I still didn't have time to do it, particularly from a gentleman in Hawaii who had uh, presented uh, results on the educational achievement. Uh, and, and it was just, I, I, to this day, and I'm talking a long time ago now, but to this day, 15 years ago, I can remember the, the aha moment that, um, that I personally had when we were doing that hearing. Um, there, my team over there from the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is still trying to figure out who I'm talking about, and they probably know, but um, it's, in a, it's in a lateral file in my office. I just haven't had time since I talked to you yesterday to uh, approach that file cabinet. Uh, so we issued, based on this three-prong review, we did issue this revision to the standard, which I think you're all familiar with, uh, in, uh, in, 19, in October, October 30th, 1997, not to put too fine a point on it. Um, and uh, that gave us time then to use the new standard in taking the census um, and then ultimately to phase in the Im implementation of the standard in what I'll call the numerator surveys, the administrative records, and, and so on, other, other programs of the government. Um, some were faster than others, frankly, um, and surveys in general did this more quickly than those who had administrative record systems. Now, <laughs> Bob Groves and I are having a big discussion about how we all got stuck with this word administrative record systems, and I know how I got stuck with it. I got stuck with it because when we were trying to think of some comprehensive com composite word to describe data that are collected for regulatory purposes, data that are collected to administer a program benefit, data da da da, we, <laughs> whoever we are, started calling them administrative records. It's sy systems we need to administer federal programs. I think it's probably the derivation if I had to make it up in, in retrospect here. So when we talk about administrative record systems in education, for example, we're talking about a system where the local <coughs> education agencies and the state education agencies are the principal keepers of those records. And we're aggregating those and bringing them up to Washington, if you will, uh, via states and so on. But school systems have to change their records. Similarly, employers, and you can think about the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission here as, as a key example of this, employers have to change their record keeping systems when we introduce a new standard. They have to do this too if we introduce industry classification or occupation. They have to change their record systems. And they would argue that this is expensive and it takes time to do that, and I think that's a legitimate um, statement. Um, so they ask for lead time when we're going to make a change like this. So if, if the uh, administrative record system, based system, seemed to be lagging behind what the survey people were able to do in implementing the standard, that's, that is a correct observation. Um, I think we finally got them. I <laughs> And what I mean by that is that the two areas that I feel in general, there may be specific exceptions, I'm sure your research shows this, but in general, the two areas that were slowest to implement these standards were in the area of education and in the area of uh, civil, <laughs> civil rights, well, maybe civil rights, uh, EEOC is, is really what I'm talking about here. The, the, uh, the compliance reporting uh, that industry has to do, uh, and industry also includes in educational institutions reporting on their teachers and so on. It, it includes hospitals reporting on their staff. Any, any entity <laughs> that has to report to the EEOC, uh, which means a lot of them, uh, they, they were last in line, if you will, in terms of implementing the standard. I would say, not because we weren't pushing, <laughs> I, I mentioned this reporting information collection review process uh, that we have at OMB 
every single time these guys came in for any sort of renewal or whatever, we were saying, when are you going to, you know, do it? And, you know, terms of clearance on these things saying, you can only have a three month extension or whatever because we're not giving you three more years, you know, until you get, get with the program here. I would like to emphasize three things in talking about the standards. Uh, one, these standards don't tell people to, don't tell federal agencies to collect data on race and ethnicity. They say if you are going to collect data on race and ethnicity, then you should use these standards. This is a distinction that's very important for people to recognize. So I don't have a standard out there that says to the Federal Communications Commission, sorry, you identified yourself earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a standard at OMB that says FCC, you have to collect data on race and ethnicity. But I do have a standard that says FCC, if you're going to promulgate a form, an information collection from the FCC that asks for data about race and ethnicity, then you've got to be consistent with these standards. Okay, so that's principle number one that I, I would like to underscore. Principle number two is this is a minimum standard. It does not say you can or can't collect greater detail if it's relevant to do that. It absolutely does not say that. But it does not prescribe greater detail because, in general, that probably depends upon what your survey is, what your information collection is, whether it makes sense in particular geographic area maybe. Depend, I, you know, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know all the answers, but I'm just saying it needs to be thought through. Now, it could be useful if an agency says they really do need to collect greater detail on the Hawaiian native <coughs> Pacific Islander, sorry, population, that they do it consistent with whatever categories we use on the <coughs> census, if those are right, by the way, as census advisors, please, you know. But to the extent, let's say, to the extent that the census has disaggregated uh, some of the larger population groups for purposes of census collection, if it makes sense and has utility, I'm going to say that word a lot of times, uh, for other surveys or information collections to be doing it, then probably the census model or the best or whatever. But I think it's <laughs> unlikely that OMB would issue more detailed <coughs> categories. We might refer people to places and say, th this is good practice. We might do a best practices sort of thing with help from you guys. But, but I don't think we're going to say, as long as we have a minimum standard, we, you, you, you heard the discussion already about suppression and, and so on. You know, we, have, we have these problems. And we, have, we do have to think of ways to get these data out uh, in, in, in better way. But collecting all this data, all these data at very detailed levels of individual components, we're going to be making false promises, I think, to the public. Because we collect it. We can collect. We can keep collecting and collecting and collecting. But if we can't publish it, then I think that's what, disingenuous? I don't know. Whatever it is, it's, it's not constructive in my personal view. Okay, so my, my second point was this is a minimum standard for comparability, but it's not pro prohibitive of more detail being collected when an agency demonstrates that it's useful to do so. I, I, I said I was going to mention the word utility, practical utility, and I will do that. I'm, one of the things that we continue to look at is balancing the burden that we impose on people against the use that will be made of the information. So it really is incumbent on those who are seeking information and seeking more detailed information to demonstrate how the information will be used. That's, that's not special for this meeting, by the way. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the overall process. And it has to do with dollar resources, but it also has to do with uh, the, the whole uh, the issue that I mentioned about the voluntary compliance of the public. The public, frankly, probably doesn't <coughs> distinguish between all the different federal agencies that are collecting information, nor do I believe that they distinguish very well between <laughs> our wonderful collections of information by the federal agencies 
and all the other information collections that come to their landlines or their cell phones or wherever they're coming to these days um, that may or may not um, have the same ultimate uses uh, in terms of uh, distribution of funds or improving educational programs or whatever we want to call them. So we have to be very careful uh, with, with how much burden that, that we add to, uh, to, to the public's perception of, of what we're asking for. So that burden, practical utility thing, balancing, I do that a lot, I'm, I, I would underscore. I'm, so I'm, if I had some recommendations, I don't know if I was asked to make recommendations, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I would say, uh, first off, and importantly, Please talk to the agencies. Now, Tom Nardone was good enough to raise his hand way in the back, and now I can see his face. Um, but there will be people with you, or they're here already, from a number of the other agencies. There's census folks here. Tom's from BLS. There may be more with him. I'm not sure. Um, folks will be here, are here or are here from the National Center for Education Statistics, from uh, the National Center for Health Statistics. I know they had a conflict today, but they're going to be with you tomorrow. Um, and, and so on, and I encourage you to talk to those people because these are the folks that you can talk to about oversampling. These are the people you can talk to about combining data over a number of years, um, about combining data sets. And, and importantly, these are people you can talk to about gaining access. We do have ways to get you access to micro data. And, you know, you can become, I am, you can become a sworn census employee. I, there, there are, there, that's elaborate. You can go to a research data center, and we're expanding the, the research data center program as we speak. Um, and it will be more available to people. You don't have to go to the dreaded Suitland <laughs> in order to take advantage of, of this capability. Sorry, that's an in-joke for those who have been to Suitland. I, I go there a lot. Um, so my recommendation, my strongest recommendation, frankly, is that you talk to um, the individuals who are here and, and continue these conversations. Um, my second recommendation, I guess, is uh, Bob did talk about, uh, Bob Groves did talk a little bit about these interagency forums that we have, for our forums, uh, that are looking across uh, at different uh, sorts of um, people we, we would like to paint portraits of, but we don't have a national center on children's statistics. We don't have a national center on aging statistics. We don't have a national center on women's statistics. I'm not sure we should, okay? But what we do need to do is give people a lens, a way to find out what information sources are available if, if their interest is in a particular group within the population, whether it's a racial ethnic group or an age group or a gender group or whatever, um, we, we can do this. We know how to do it. It does take resources to do it. The data exists, but bringing them together, making a publication, um, standardizing the way we're presenting the information so people aren't confused when we have different scales on the data and so on, um, that takes resources. But it can be done, because we've proven we, we know how to do it. Um, and so if that's something to be discussed further, you know, maybe that's something to be, to be talked about. Advisory structures, I was just kind of laughing, because I was thinking about when they were talking about redistricting. Um, there's a former census director. There's not very many people who are as old as me in this room. But <laughs> there's a former census director who was named Vince Barraba. And, and he was known to a lot of people, because he actually was called twice to direct the census. Uh, once by each administration, which was interesting. But leading up to the 80 census, uh, Vince convened, to the best of my knowledge, for the first time in the departmental auditorium at the Department of Commerce, uh, representatives from every racial and ethnic group that he could think of. And he sat up on the stage and listened for hours. It was unbelievable. I mean, I was in the audience. Um, and I just had to really admire what he did, but I think it led to, in some measure, it led to the formation of the racial and ethnic advisory committees that, that um, Bob Groves had, had mentioned this morning, in, to, to have a more consistent and orderly and a lot, uh, anyway, uh, discussion. I am not aware of any of the other agencies having something similar to these REACT committees. 
um, if they have them, I don't know about them, and that they some of them do have advisory committees or um, technical advisory groups or something. We have issues sometimes about it, the word advisory committee, but um, but you know that's another area that people may want to think about talking to agencies about how to have a better presence or a more meaningful presence or whatever. I, I need to finish the story about Vince by saying that I recently uh, was asked to help him out a little bit. Um, <laughs> Bob said that he would never want to be involved in redistricting, but Vince Barabba is going to be one of the pr public members of the California <laughs> Redistricting Commission uh, for this uh, round of the census. So for those who know Vince, this is a particularly amusing uh, moment. Um, so um, then um, please, please do uh, think about uh, this is not a recommendation, but please do keep in mind this collection versus, I'll call it publication. I, that's an old-fashioned word. But uh, the ability to, to collect is one thing. The ability to make it uh, available uh, to users is, is something else. And, and we need to keep that in mind. I'm, and uh, I think I'm, if that's, I think that's most of what I wanted to say. Um, so I, I, I will take questions, <laughs> if there are questions. I'm, oh, thank I'm you very sure much. there will be a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. so just, just to let folks know, we'll just go over a few minutes, and that just means you have to run and get your lunch and come back. <laughs> so um, do you have our microphones up? Who can our staff can help? Yeah. So why don't, Priscilla, why don't you go ahead? And if you could keep your questions short, we can get longer answers. And since I don't know the people in the room, it really was helpful this morning when people identified themselves. Um, thanks so much. I'm Priscilla. I'm with the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum. And um, I had a question for all the panelists, but perhaps Dr. Um, Islam in particular. I thought the statistics about cellular use were really interesting. Mm -hmm. And with the movement through the Affordable Care Act and through ARA towards, you know, building a health IT infrastructure and kind of, you know, putting everything, electronic patient records and everything online, and to encourage people to enroll and to do all of that um, eligibility um, processes online. I'm wondering if there are similar research or um, data or information about internet use within our communities. Uh, there are a few surveys that have looked at computer and internet um, access and usage. I think it's in the uh, current population survey. Uh, clearly, one of the big problems is that the current population survey sample is not huge, so we get into issues about subpopulations. There's ongoing research individual at different sites uh, doing surveys about access to internet and access to computers. Uh, one of my graduate students right now is doing a specialized survey among Japanese Americans, particularly elderly Japanese Americans, who actually has one of the lowest usage and access uh, to computer and internet. Uh, so, yes, there's work being done. There's much more work that needs to be done. Uh, how it might be related to data collection is that there is a movement to uh, put surveys on the Internet, you know, um, Survey Monkey and all these other sort of things. And I think we're just beginning to understand both the potential and limitations of that approach. So there's some research where we're piggybacking both traditional surveys, uh, telephone-based surveys, and we've made some, we actually have made progress in terms of dealing with the cellular phone, in terms of telephone-based uh, surveys, but piggybacking that on top of a parallel survey where we do on the internet, because we really need to do basic research in terms of these de different methodologies, uh, both their potential and limitations, particularly as they apply to Asian and Pacific Americans. So work's being done, but much more work needs to be done. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We have collected information on internet use and some of the local studies that we've done, and we found um, varying rates. It tends to be by by age. So we, we have found among younger Asian populations, there's higher use of the internet. Older, much less. Um, in terms of implications for, you know, we use a lot of this data as formative research to inform intervention studies or intervention research, and so. For example, in our hepatitis B work, we're developing a social marketing campaign. So clearly the use of internet might be a great vehicle in terms of targeting younger Asian American community members. Okay, Lisa? 
Uh, I just had a question for OMB, <coughs> um, Lisa Hasegawa National Capacity. Is, is there any um, precedence for having different levels of data collection standards for different states? Um, so, uh, like in a rural context, or I, I don't know what the uh, other analogy is, but I was just wondering if there was any kind of, kind of model like that. Because I think one thing that, you know, I've put out there before and it might be interesting to consider is whether or not we could have different um, uh, kind of relationship or requirements for federal programs that are in like the states that have the largest API population. So I was just wondering if there was another analogous sort of framework for other sorts of um, issues or special populations. Thanks. I, without being able to uh, give you a specific site here, although I could probably at back at the office, I, I, I can say with reasonable confidence that we do have uh, in uh, some of our information collections, and I, I, they could be both in surveys and in some of the administrative collections, I think, um, uh, precedents for um, you know, more detailed collection of specific racial and ethnic information in, in a particular set of states where, where there's a preponderance of a population, whatever. Um, I, I think that's, that precedent um, can be demonstrated and, and that those who did it demonstrated the practical utility. That's, I'm sorry to sound like a, a, you know, whatever you call it, broken record. Must be some new expression for that too. But um, I, I, I think yes is the answer to your question. Hi, uh, Kathy Aloha Maile Tawali'i, uh, Director of the Native Hawaiian Epidemiology Center at Papa Olulokahi. Um, thank you for coming. Um, we really appreciate thank it. Thank you for coming. You've come a long way. I did. <laughs> Twelve-hour flight. There's a few of us yeah. who made it. Yeah. Um, I, I was cu curious. Um, the um, you folks have done a, a great job at making sure that the mandate is in place for the separation of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander data. Yet when we get access to the data files, and we have been able to through vital statistics and the folks, Ed Sondick and his crew have been very helpful in getting us access. But when we, when we look at the data and start to pull it down and look at the granularity, within the, the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander category is a category that's titled Other Asian Pacific Islander. And it's really difficult because it's within the Native Hawaiian Oh, really? There is. And it's a very large category, actually. Um, it's a, a, and it, every state that is recording Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander is within that category, putting us quite a bit of people into the other Asian Pacific Islander category, which is a subcategory within the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander data. So when we present, now that we have access, now that we are working in partnership with our federal partners, now that we have built the informatic tools in order to analyze seven million plus data points and actually do it with statistical confidence, we still run into the problem where we can't, with confidence, release data on Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders because the data for that category actually still includes a very substantial Asian category. But we don't actually know how many are Asian and how many are Pacific Islander. And um, I think both the Asian population as well as the Native Hawaiian Pacific Isle population really needs to have a clear separation um, when we're trying to do that work. So. Is there a way that you might be able to help us address that other Asian I, I would PI? be delighted to help you address it. And I'm, I, as, as you know better than I do, or as well as I do in any event, I'm, a lot of that probably was driven by the Association for Vital Records, whatever it's called, and the state registrars coming to consensus on what is ultimately a state form, not a, not a federal form. But we need to approach this. I had no idea until you mentioned it. So that's the first step right there. We're working with um, local health officials to show that guideline. Yeah. I think that's great. There is, um, is there anyone from NCHS who was able to be here today? Probably not. They. Oh, here. Mm -hmm. I can't see. Someone is here. Oh, hi. Is that Jack? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> how are she you? knows everyone. <laughs> well, no, but Jackie, Jackie was actually, you know, Bob was singling out people who deserve credit for the 2010 census back home. Jackie was one of the ones who worked with us on the standards when we were doing our work in, back in the 90s, right? right. <laughs> um, but I, I would mention there is a board of scientific counselors um, mm. that, that advises NCHS, um, and I sit ex officio on that, so I get to go. Um, but 
maybe, you know, there is someone from the vital records, actually there's a couple people from the vital records constituency who are members of that, so it seems to me if you could do your data, the data's worth a thousand anecdotes, right? Okay, if you could do your data, get it into the vital records people, maybe we can get it on that agenda, or there, there are other ways that we can probably pursue, but I think that would be reasonable. Can I send you a report? Please do. <laughs> to Jackie. Yes, and to Jackie, please. Thank Great. You. Thank you so much. I'd like to take this time to thank our panelists. And I encourage you to continue the discussion. Um, we have about 15 minutes to get your lunch and come back and we have administrative, administration officials to join us.